I was born in the city of Perth, Perthshire, Scotland, on the 12th of January, 1831, and am the fifth of ten daughters born to my parents, John and Christina Graham. My attention was first brought to the Church of Latter-day Saints in 1846, and in 1847 I was baptized and confirmed, being the second person baptized into the church in Perth. This course brought down upon me so much persecution, from which I was not exempt in my own father's house, that I soon left home and went to Edinburgh. There I was kindly received by Sister Gibson and welcomed into her house. After two years had passed, my father came to me, and, manifesting a better spirit than when I saw him last, prevailed upon me to return with him. He had in the meantime become partially paralyzed, and had to use a crutch. Two weeks after my return, he consented to be baptized. While being baptized, the affliction left him, and he walked home without his crutch, to the astonishment of all who knew him. This was the signal for a great work, and the Perth branch, which previously had numbered but two, soon grew to over 150 members. In May 51, I was married to Alexander MacDonald, then an elder in the church. He went immediately on mission to the Highlands, but in 1852 he was called to take charge of the Liverpool Conference, whither I went with him, and there we made our first home together. In May 53, I fell downstairs, which so seriously injured me that I remained bedridden until the following marvelous occurrence. One Saturday afternoon, as I was feeling especially depressed and sorrowful, and while my neighbor, Mrs. Kent, who had just been in, was gone to her home for some little luxury for me, as I turned in my bed, I was astonished to behold an aged man standing at the foot. As I somewhat recovered from my natural timidity, he came towards the head of the bed and laid his hands upon me, saying, I lay my hands upon thy head and bless thee in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord hath seen the integrity of thine heart. In tears and sorrow thou hast bowed before the Lord, asking for children. This blessing is about to be granted unto thee. Thou shalt be blessed with children from this hour. Thou shalt be gathered to the valleys of the mountains, and there thou shalt see thy children, raised as tender plants by thy side. Thy children and household shall call thee blessed. At present thy husband is better than many children. Be comforted. These blessings I seal upon thee in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this moment, Sister Kent came in, and I saw no more of this personage. His presence was so impressed upon me that I can to this day minutely describe his clothing and countenance. The next conference, after this visitation, brought the word that Brother MacDonald was released to go to the valley, being succeeded by Elder Spicer W. Crandall. We started from Liverpool in March 54, and after the usual vicissitudes of sea and river navigation, finally went into camp near Kansas Village on the Missouri. From there we started for Utah in Captain Daniel Carnes' company, reaching Salt Lake City on the 30th of September. In 1872, my husband was appointed to settle in St. George, where we arrived about the middle of November. Here we have since remained, and I have taken great pleasure in this southern country especially in having my family around me in the midst of good influences. The people here are sociable and kind, and we have no outside influences to contend with. All are busy and industrious and striving to live their religion. The reader will have noticed in the sketches of the sisters, both American and foreign, frequent mention of the gift of tongues. This seems to have been markedly the woman's gift. One of the first who manifested it approvedly was Mother Whitney. She was commanded by the prophet Joseph to rise and sing in the gift of tongues in the early days of Kirtland. She did so, and Joseph pronounced it the Adamic tongue, or the language spoken by Adam. Parley P. Pratt afterwards gave a written interpretation of it. It was a story and verse of Adam blessing his family in Adam on Diamond the Garden of Eden in America.
as an instance in which the gift of tongues proved of decided practical value. One morning we thought we would go and gather gooseberries. Father Tanner, as we familiarly called the good patriarchal elder Nathan Tanner, harnessed a span of horses to a light wagon, and with two sisters by the name of Lyman, his little granddaughter, and me, started out. When we reached the woods, we told the old gentleman to go to a house in sight and rest himself while we picked the berries. It was not long before the little girl and I strayed some distance from the rest, when suddenly we heard shouts. The little girl thought it was her grandfather, and was about to answer, but I restrained her, thinking it might be Indians. We walked forward until well within sight of Father Tanner, when we saw he was running his team around. We thought nothing strange at first, but as we approached we saw Indians gathering around the wagon, whooping and yelling as others came and joined them. We got into the wagon to start when four of the Indians took hold of the wagon wheels to stop the wagon, and the other two held the horses by the bits, and another came to take me out of the wagon. I then began to be afraid as well as vexed and asked Father Tanner to let me get out of the wagon and run for assistance. He said, No, poor child, it is too late. I told him they should not take me alive. His face was as white as a sheet. The Indians had commenced to strip him, had taken his watch and handkerchief, and while stripping him were trying to pull me out of the wagon. I began silently to appeal to my Heavenly Father. While praying and struggling, the Spirit of the Almighty fell upon me, and I arose with great power, and no tongue can tell my feelings. I was happy as I could be. A few moments before, I saw worse than death staring me in the face, and now my hand was raised by the power of God, and I talked to those Indians in their own language. They let go the horses and wagon and all stood in front of me while I talked to them by the power of God. They bowed their heads and answered yes in a way that made me know what they meant. The little girl and Father Tanner looked on in speechless amazement. I realized our situation, their calculation was to kill Father Tanner, burn the wagon and take us women prisoners. This was plainly shown me. When I stopped talking, they shook hands with all three of us and returned all they had taken from Father Tanner, who gave them back the handkerchief and I gave them berries and crackers. By this time, the other two women came up, and we hastened home. The Lord gave me a portion of the interpretation of what I had said, which was as follows. I suppose you Indian warriors think you are going to kill us. Don't you know the Great Spirit is watching you and knows everything in your heart? We have come out here to gather some of our Father's fruit. We have not come to injure you. And if you harm us or injure one hair of our heads, the Great Spirit shall smite you to the earth, and you shall not have power to breathe another breath. We have been driven from our homes, and so have you. We have come out here to do you good and not to injure you. We are the Lord's people, and so are you. But you must cease your murders and wickedness. The Lord is displeased with it, and will not prosper you if you continue in it. You think you own all this land, this timber, this water, all the horses? Why, you do not own one thing on earth, not even the air you breathe. It all belongs to the Great Spirit. Mm -hmm.